I am sure that each of us have a special place that we like to go to, right? Where we can get recharged and connect with ourselves more and feel more whole. For those of you who might be introverted, that's typically by yourself. I'm married to an introvert, right, who finds her little cave that she can hide out in throughout our house. And me, the extrovert, is constantly coming into those caves, right, to try to find how I can recharge my energy and breaking into someone's, right, safe space of recharging. My wife is like this, my, my best friend in the world is like this, both individuals who need to basically disappear from every person around them so that they can get time to charge back up, right? To, to, to fill the tank back up. Who is like that? Who is the person here that needs to, I need to have time by myself or I will, I will go crazy, right? I'm not that person, bless you if you are. I can't imagine that life, but it, it works, right? I'm, I, I am the opposite. In seminary, when I would have to study Greek and Hebrew note cards, I would go to a bar and sit in the corner just to have people around me, a, 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 a tiny little wooden cutout inside a library where nobody's talking, you can't see a person, is the place where I'll get the least amount of work done. Even to read a book, if someone is in the room with me, I will, I will actually pay attention to the book. Something about the human connection. But if, my, if I'm in the room, my wife is reading, right? Breathing too loud, moving your feet too much, whatever it might be, that that cannot happen. In seminary, I, I went to Princeton Seminary and, and at the Princeton University, they don't have uh, sororities and fraternities. They have what are called eating clubs, which are basically fraternities and sororities, right? You pay a whole bunch of money, surprise, surprise, it's Princeton, and you get to be a member of this club and they come serve you food and every club has a big party on Saturday nights. And one of these clubs thought it was a great idea to hire seminarians as their bouncers for these clubs on Saturday nights until 3 a.m., which is what I did every Saturday night for three years in seminary. And I would sit there, pretending to look at IDs and putting wristbands on people, flipping through note cards, right? It, it helped me be able to take it all in and to study. And I had had friends who were like, I don't know how you could possibly do that and then one, be ready to go to work on Sunday morning in New York City after you got back at 3.30 in the morning. But it worked, and I was charged up, and I passed my Hebrew and Greek classes. So those places that we go to of moments of recharging, the one that I can actually do by myself, which I try to do as often as I possibly can, is to take out my bike, right? I have, I have, I have two bikes, I have a road bike, I have a mountain bike, I would prefer to mountain bike every single day if I possibly could, but with two little kids, it's easier as a road bike. But I, I love being outside, flying as fast as I possibly can, right? Hearing the sound of wind in the, in the fall, hearing the leaves crunch under my tires, getting a little risky on a, on a spot that's got rocks and roots. Um, I have a lot of scars to prove how risky I have been sometimes that I shouldn't have been. So, he's got a broken arm right now from a bike? Yes. <laughs> We could share war stories, man. So being out there in the mountains makes me feel whole. I grew up in San Jose, California, in the Bay Area. The Sierra Nevadas are not very far away. The, the, the foothills that overlook the bay are just 30 minutes away from my house. Being out in the mountains, someplace high up, it, 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 it makes me feel more of who I am, right? Fully John, out on a mountain bike even just jumping off a rock someplace, but on a hill, I feel whole. That's just not new, right? Cultures throughout the world have used mountains as this image of, of a divine, sacred place, right? We see it throughout our own text of the Old Testament. Where, where does Moses go, right, up to a mountaintop to have this experience with God, to, bring, to come back down and to offer relief for people who are wandering in the wilderness? Where does Jesus go when he is going to re retreat for those 40 days before he faces the cross off to a mountain to overlook and see the land, the people that he has been charged to save? There is something sacred and special about the mountain, right? It's, 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 it makes us feel more human, more alive, tapped in the nature of who we are. Ancient people thought that the mountains were the places where gods lived, right? Mount Olympus. 
It makes sense. The sun comes up from the mountains, right? I don't know what's beyond that, but I know that the sun rises out of the top of that mountain. That's where the stars start to come out at nighttime. The moon comes from the mountain. The sun sets behind the mountain. Therefore, up there, there must be something sacred and special and holy that only the gods know about because all the things that we know come and rise and fall and take their lifespan from the mountains. They're special, they're sacred. We, they, they, they force us to look up at something, to, to, to admire the peaks, the snow, the snow tops, whatever it might be, the, the, the volcano, right? We look up to the top of the mountain. Us having this mountaintop experience physically while we are there is not a new phenomenon. For those of us who enjoy that, we are tapping into something that is tens of thousands of years old. A place where we go to recharge, to feel more of ourselves, either by ourselves or maybe with somebody else. But the mountains are something special. This text, though, is a couple thousand year old reminder that no, the gods or our God does not live in that mountain. That, that mountaintop, as great as it might be, as wonderful as, as, as it is of being up there and looking down over the valley or imagining that the sun and moon rising from its peaks, as great as that might be, that is not where we find our help. That is not where we find the very real presence of God. This, this story, this, this psalm of praise is now a revolutionary for its time. That that is not where God lives. If you are looking up to the mountains for help, that's not where you're going to find it. God does not need the mountain. God does not need you to just be at that place to have your moment of realizing who you are and fully tapping in to the very person, unique being, that God has made you to be. But looking for help, looking for help is still, is still what we do. That is what it is to be a human being of, of I am in trouble, I am in need. Where do I turn next? Where do I find support for what I need going forward? For what I need next, where do I go? For those of you who are our parents, shout out over here. For those of you who are parents, that question is, is, is daily, right? What hell can, can there possibly be? Especially during a pandemic where kids are locked at, at home nonstop. I remember uh, when we went home with our first grown child from the hospital, I was like, you're just letting us go? You're just going to let us put this thing in the car and drive home? Nobody's coming with us? We're going to have to figure this out ourselves? Where, where's the help? What am I supposed to do? There's, I can't open up the back and read the instructions, right? Where do I find help and as a parent that you think oh after after this this period it's gonna it's gonna get easier we figured this thing out no 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 <laughs> a new problem a new attitude a new perspective now emerges into this tiny little being and you ask that question where can I turn to right is it Daniel Tiger is it my preschool teacher where can I go for help all of us, all of us have that deep des de desire inside of us to have more access to help, a way for us to navigate looking through the world. This reminder in this story today is helpful for us, as it was thousands of years ago, of where it is that we turn for our help. Why we come together, why we gather together as people here in this space, or for those of us who are joining us online, I don't know where your cameras are, but hello online folks, 
right? We, we, we come together not as something that just makes us feel good, not as a moment to recharge on Sunday so we can tackle on the week going forward. We are driven of coming together out of our faith, something that we cannot explain nor, nor fully define, right? We, we, we can't capture it in any type of statement or chapters of books, we cannot fully describe what faith is, but that is what draws us to this community, that we believe God is up to something in the world and in our lives. And when I gather together with people like this, when I come together, then I am able to live into that more fully. Everything that we do as a church should be rooted in our faith. And that's what this is asked in this passage today, is to have that faith. When you are in doubt, when you are full of fear, when you are terrified, when you don't know where to go next, is to have faith that the God of existence and creation is with you, not waiting behind a mountain. Not, not tucked in a little corner in a very sacred special place that only a few t- can go to. That your God is with you everywhere. This God doesn't sleep. This God doesn't rest. This God is looking out for you always, always. The ask is to have faith. And where we fall short sometimes is the church, much like ancient folks did, of trying to understand why the gods lived in the mountain. We try to fully define it and put it in a box rather than let it be expansive, rather than let it be a full mystery that we cannot explain. Because there are so many people in our culture and society who are asking that question. Where? Where can I get help? Where do I turn next? I have tried everything. I have looked up to the mountaintops. I have read every podcast. I have gone to every silent retreat. I've been to every yoga class and meditation and mindful practice. Where do I turn next? Because those things are not fulfilling me. They scratch the itch. A little bit they give me a moment of respite and relief but they don't last they don't have that eternal unchanging presence in my life friends that is what we have in our faith if we let it be faith if we let it be a ground that we cannot see nor describe a better translation of the word faith, I, 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 I wish we, we, we did this more in our, in our own tradition, is moving from a faith into a word of, of trust, right? Because there is, there is no verb in the English language for faith. You can't go around faithing in something, right? We don't, we don't have that. that. That exists in Hebrew, that exists in Greek, a verb for what it means to faith, but we don't have one, so then we say believe. And believe today means more about this, right, than it does about this. But if I trust something, if I trust it, then I am living it in my heart rather than me trying to define it in my head. Am I going to believe that that pew is going to hold me up or am I going to trust that it was a good craftsman who put it together and that I can sit, sit back in it and it won't fall? That I step out into this world trusting, trusting that the God that I can't see, the God that I can't explain, the God that I cannot define is there ever ready to help and assist me is ever ready to hear me the moment i cry out that is the story of god's people from the beginning until today that the crying out is what god responds to the desire to be in the presence of god is what god is excited about for our relationship with the very real living breathing and moving When we come down to this table later this morning, we are going to be stepping out onto that field of trust. 
The word sacrament comes from the, word for the, the root word for what it means to be a mystery of something that we cannot describe nor fully explain, but that we trust that when we come out into this table that we are encountering God in a very unique and special and holy and sacred way that we can't fully describe or define, but knowing that when we do this, we are getting just that much closer, that much closer to the very real presence of God that is always, always around us. There is so much faith that goes into what happens down here, from, from, from the, the way that grapes grow on vines to the way bread is made. I was one of those people in the early days of the pandemic who, who started a sourdough starter, right, and turned into a little pet that I had to feed every week. Um, still do it. I, I took bread out of the oven this morning and was texting, voice texting my wife in the car like, how's the second loaf look? How is she doing? Is she okay? And there's so much faith that goes into making bread. I make bread the exact same way every single time. Every single loaf comes out different. I have to trust that the temperature and the bacteria and, and the, 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 the weight of the flour and the water are going to be doing something that I can't fully describe nor explain, but something is happening in that mixture that is going to transform these three simple ingredients of water, salt, and flour into delicious, mouth-watering sourdough bread. I have to have faith. Letting go and watch and see what happens. So grace, those of you who are in positions, which I hope is everybody, all of us right now, that none of us have this fully figured out, I need some help. I need to know where I'm supposed to go next. I'm unsure of where I am right now. The invitation that is thousands of years old and the invitation is today is to have faith, to trust that the very real presence of our living, moving, walking, talking, fully present God is here with us. The temptation to lift our eyes up to the hills, whatever those hills might be, whatever it is the place that, that offers you a chance to recharge and has been a comfort place for you, to go beyond that and to remember, to remember, that God is always here with us, ready, ever ready, to hear our cry when we cry out. Where do I turn next? Where do I go for help? It is here. It is with you right now. A God who does not sleep, a God who does not slumber, a God who is re ever ready to hear your cry. But it takes us trusting takes us having that faith to step out, knowing that God is ready to lead us on to the next.